Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm the Senior Acquisitions Editor here at Springer Publishing Company for Counseling. And today you're joining us for a presentation on career and employment counseling of people with disabilities in the COVID and post-COVID world. Five things you need to know presented by Dr. David Strauser. A uh, couple of little things to let you know, we will be taking questions. If you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box. You see the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. And if you have any questions during this event, please put them, pose them in the Q&A box and we will try to get your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, also, we will be uh, disseminating the recording of this event. This event is being recorded and we will be sending it out to you along with the PowerPoint deck. I know a lot of people ask for the presentation deck. We will be sending a recording of this event along with the PowerPoint deck from Dr. Strauser in about five to seven business days. And when you get the presentation, by all means, share it with your colleagues, folks who were not able to attend live today. And let me introduce our uh, speaker today, Dr. David Strauser. He received his PhD in rehabilitation psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has been the recipient of many prestigious awards, including the National Council on Rehabilitation Education's Researcher of the Year Award and New Career Award, the James Garrett Distinguished Career Research Award from the American Rehabilitation Counseling Association as well. Dr. Strauser has also been the recipient of the George N. Wright Varsity Award given to an outstanding alumni of the Rehabilitation Psychology Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And in 2019, he received the King McChrystal Distinguished Research Award from the College of Applied Health Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research focuses on the career and vocational development of young adults, including young adults with cancer. Dr. Strauser is the editor of the journal Rehabilitation Research, Policy and Education, and the book Career Development, Employment and Disability and Rehabilitation from Theory to Practice that we'll be touching on today. And he is also the co-editor of the textbook Assessment and Rehabilitation and Mental Health Counseling, also from Springer Publishing. He's authored over 130 journal articles and book chapters and is consistently recognized as an international leader regarding the career and vocational development of individuals with disabilities and chronic health conditions. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Strauser, for joining us today, and I'm going to let you take over from here. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. And it's always good to talk about career development and career development issues. And I think we're uh, at an especially relevant time in our history here where career development will be on the front lines again um, of importance as people are dealing with this economy. So with that as a backdrop, I'm gonna try to emphasize five things today in the talk. Um, as the title says, five things you need to know. So here on this slide, we kind of go over, I think, five things that are going to be really relevant, um, and especially in a COVID, post-COVID world. And one is I want to talk a little bit about the Im impact of COVID-19 on frontline and marginalized workers and how they've been disproportionately hit and how that can, is going to be creating some opportunities for career and vocational counselors to be working with this group to transition. Um, second point would be to talk about how the type of work that these individuals have typically done in the labor market, which they're participating in their wages, have some impact for the career development process that need to be considered. Um, highlight why career development is important in this COVID and post-COVID labor market as people are looking to make changes and being forced to make changes. I'm going to introduce the work, Illinois Working Wellbeing Model, which is highlighted in the career book, uh, chapter one, and kind of prevents, presents a basis for many of the things that are discussed in the book talk about that model, um, why it's relevant and how it can be used. And then I'll conclude by talking about three specific issues um, I think are gonna be really important as we move forward to work with individuals with chronic health conditions and disabilities, uh, COVID and post COVID. So with that, the impact of COVID-19, um, I think has been well documented here um, and it's disproportionate effect on certain areas of the labor market and certain types of employees is uh, well accepted and continuing to grow in terms of the impact. Um, it's gonna have a 
significant disproportionate and long-term impact on the economy and the way work is going to be performed. Um, that's going to be changing the type of work that gets done, where work gets done, and what sectors of the labor market are going to grow um, in the future and er other areas of the labor market that are going to uh, retract or uh, become diminished in, in relevance. Um, with this, uh, individuals on the front line and marginalized workers are occupying a lot of jobs that have been hit. Um, the service sector is an area that has significantly been hit as restaurant, the restaurant industry has uh, again been significantly impacted and continues to struggle uh, as we speak about how it is going to um, rebound from this and um, survive. Frontline healthcare workers, again, across the country are on the are, are being impacted um, from doctors and nurses, but also uh, more entry level or lower level uh, frontline workers, certified nursing assistants, health technicians um, are being significantly impacted with that, as well as essential workers, workers that are deemed essential, um, whether that is uh, people working in the food industry, the grocery industry, other sectors that are determined to be essential and where they're needing to go to work. A key part of all of these jobs is that they're not allowing for remote or alternative work formats. People who are doing well, and I use that term kind of loosely, well in this COVID economy are people who can work remotely, change how work is being done, their work is uh, more flexible, allows them to modify their work and still be productive. Marginalized workers and frontline workers who are um, their types of positions are not uh, conducive to this. And as a result, they're needing to continue to go into work, continuing to deal with people and continuing to continue to put themselves at risk. Um, so we talk about marginalized backgrounds and mar marginalized workers. Who are we talking about specifically? Uh, we're talking about people of color, women, people with chronic illness and disability, and people from criminal history who have a criminal background who may be getting out of prison, uh, being released back into the community. I would also throw another group in here that I didn't highlight, and that is foster care youth, kids aging out of foster care. And then I also think what we're talking about is also kids on special education programs who are transitioning into the labor market for the first time. Um, last thing here on this slide is that the individuals here, we talk about uh, the frontline workers, the health workers, the service sectors workers, as well as marginalized workers, because of the nature of the work that they are doing and um, the work environment that they're interacting with, they're at increased risk for de developing physical and psychological injuries that will cause potentially chronic health conditions or exacerbating existing, pre-existing chronic health or disabling conditions. So they're at extreme risk um, and people that will be needing services, career services moving forward um, in, in, in months and years to come. One thing that's characteristic um, of marginalized workers in general and people working in the jobs that I just outlined, whether it's essential work workers, service sector workers, or low end uh, entry level front uh, health workers is they're, they're impacted not only by COVID, but also they have low wages. Their jobs tend to be high demand, meaning that there's a lot of stress on them. They tend to be no, the job environment tends to be uh, highlighted by low control over their work. Uh, their jobs also are characterized by unsafe conditions. Certainly the lack of PPE um, has been well documented, but I think you go to the grocery store now and you go to certain places, you see how many precautions are taking there. But even with, with those environments, people are still put at risk. These jobs tend to be socially isolating. Uh, they tend to have high job insecurity and they have limited workplace protections in general, um, only magnified by COVID. So it's a combination of these conditions that were pre-existing before COVID, the socially isolating high job insecurity and limited workplace, per, workplace protections, plus the COVID conditions, they're putting people at risk um, for developing short and long-term conditions, physical and psychological injuries or exacerbation of conditions. Um, and that's only exemplified more by the fact that many of these people who are working in these environments have pre-existing health conditions already 
that are impacted, that will be impacted by COVID, whether we're talking about diabetes, hypertension, obesity, um, other respiratory chronic health conditions or cardiovascular health conditions um, that they're bringing to the, to the workplace every day, uh, even without COVID. Um, again, the interaction of these COVID and non-COVID factors are gonna have short and long-term impacts on the career development process. And we'll talk a little bit about those today moving forward. So we have a lot going on here and a lot of things that are interacting and putting these individuals at significant risk uh, in the labor market and significant risk of re-entering the labor market post-COVID. With that, I really believe uh, very strongly that career employment counseling plays a very critical role right now. Um, as the labor market undergoes significant changes, uh, transitioning away from certain sectors of uh, the um, service economy, whether it's a restaurant industry, hotel, housekeeping, uh, individuals are going to be looking to change jobs or needing to change jobs. And this nature of how work is being performed and where it's being performed is going to impact those individuals' ability to re-enter the labor market um, or stay in the labor market. And that is where going to be a critical career counseling issue that, that needs to be addressed. Um, these large number of individuals who are currently displaced and are going to be displaced down the road. Um, I think I watch the news every day here, watch uh, CNBC, we see more and more layoffs happening, more and more sectors of the economy being impacted by this. Um, people are going to have to find new positions. People are going to have to develop new skills. People are going to have to develop new, both hard and soft skills to relate to the labor market. So that will be a, a critical factor that will be, need to be addressed through career counseling. Uh, the development and exacerbation of chronic health conditions will be critical. It's going to be people who have pre-existing health conditions that their condition is going to be exacerbated by uh, COVID and potential exposure to COVID or people who have developed chronic health conditions because of their exposure to COVID. And some of the reality right now with COVID is we don't know what some of the long-term effects are from people who have developed COVID. So we might see down the road here, three, four, five years down the road, people who have some long-term lingering effects of COVID, they're gonna be impacting their ability to work. Those factors need to be taken into account as well when we talk about all three phases of the career development process, which I always term like career awareness, job acquisition and job maintenance. So career counseling will play a critical role in this. It will play a critical role in helping people be able to maintain connection with the labor market um, if, they're, if they're hanging on and also help people develop new opportunities if they're needing to make changes and re-enter the labor market in new areas. Uh, one model that I think is um, relevant uh, that is talked about in the career development book um, that we have used at the University of Illinois quite a bit and we've conducted a fair amount of research on this model as it relates to career development is the Illinois Work and Wellbeing model. And this is a multi-domain model that consists of three major domains, the contextual domain, the career employment domain, and the participation domain. And I'll talk about those in a minute, in a little bit more detail on each one. This model is based on the International Classification of Functioning, the ICF. So if those of you are familiar with the ICF, you should start to see some of the rel uh, remnants of the ICF in here, whether it's the limitations, environmental and personal factors, the participation domain comes from the ICF. So this is grounded in the health model and ICF framework. Um, and very importantly, to talk about the integration of health and functioning as it relates to career development. I think another key part of this model that I'll talk about in a little bit as well is allows for what I call multi-level analysis, which can help counselors and, and uh, providers identify primary, secondary, and tertiary factors and, and effects that help people fully conceptualize the career, career issues that are, the individuals are dealing with so that interventions can be targeted and supports can be uh, utilized to help an individual uh, reach their potential and be successful in the career development process. With that, let's talk about the contextual domain. The contextual domain consists of three primary factors. So I talk about terms in, in, in this model in terms of domains and factors. Domains are broad, factors are specific. Factors, um, three factors, the personal, environmental, and 
functional or slash limitations factor. So let me talk about each one in a little bit of detail here. The personal factor are things that belong within the individual. And those would be like personality, interest, values, gender, age, ethnicity, person's aptitude, achievement level, educational attainment, identity, uh, vocational identity. Certainly that's going to be a big part when we talk about the career part, but also there are other areas of identity, uh, gender identity, um, social identity, um, sexual identity are all things that are going to be part of that, that factor as well. Their past personal experiences that they have had that uh, um, constitute kind of a constructionist type approach to who they are. And then their temperament as well, their disposition. And then the environmental factors um, or things that make up the environmental factor would be certainly things, uh, culture, the broader culture, society, the economic environment. Certainly we can throw COVID in there right now in terms of uh, uh, disease and pathology, but also as well as its economic impact. Uh, the broader physical environment, the quality of education that exists within that person's uh, um, domain, uh, the services that are available, the political environment, and the social attitudes um, constitute the environmental factors. And let me just add right now too, for all of these factors, these are this is not a comprehensive list of factors or personal attributes or environmental attributes. These are just examples of things that can fall into those domains and probably some of the most common ones that people think about. The last area here is what, what uh, I typically would call functional limitations together as a term. People might call it functioning, people might call it limitations, either one is fine, but it's really the person's capacity and performance to be able to um, you know, meet the demands of and, and perform uh, to meet the physical demands, cognitive demands, effective demands, and communication demands. So we tend to think of communi uh, those four dimensions there, physical, cognitive, effective, and communication is making a functioning. If you notice in this model, we have these bi-directional arrows, which would suggest that these factors interact with each other and have a reciprocal effect meaning a change in the personal factors could certainly impact limitations and impact environmental factors as a change in limitations could impact personal and environmental factors as well. That will be important when we start to talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary analysis, okay? So this is the contextual domain. And let me take this here as we're moving through this pretty quick due to time. This is very much outlined in the first chapter of the career book also outlined several other, other papers as well. But the first chapter of the career book has this very well documented in more detail if you care to get more detail into this model. Um, the career domain is um, typically the factors that are addressed in the career development process of the broader career development, not just in vocational rehabilitation or rehabilitation counseling, but the broader career vocational psychology uh, network. Uh, First domain, in my opinion, that I think is really relevant is, or the factor is awareness. That would be how people think of themselves in terms of their vocational identity, aware of career options that are available to them, their maturity uh, from a vocational perspective and their work personality. So these are a lot of things we talk about traditional career counseling, helping people become aware, look at job options, look at their identity that are addressed in career counseling. Uh, the second area is what I call acquisition. And this is really focused on the job search or seeking uh, and securing, whether it's education or employment. Um, so I have uh, education employment acquisition here as people who might become aware that I need to go to school. It's uh, identifying where the school is and getting admission to and securing admission to, to uh, that school. It'd be the same if we're talking about getting to a specific job helping that person identify a specific job and going about conducting a job search, interviewing, securing that job. The last part of the career model would be, the factor would be maintenance. And that is be, being able to keep a job once you have it, um, being able to stay in school once you're there, be able to meet the demands of the environment, stay dynamically in contact with that, that uh, um, that environment so that you're able to continue to meet the demands as those demands continue to change. And that's where I have on this slide here the term work adjustment, because I think work adjustment is really a critical part of this is being able to adjust to the work environment, the school environment, the career environment as things change. 
Okay, the last domain, which will be not as much of a focus in today's talk, will be the participation domain. And these are major outcomes related to uh, well being and functioning, and that is being able to function in the home environment, society, and uh, appropriate social relationships, including your societal roles as well as your intimate relationships, your ability to be part of a community and work uh, in a community environment, and also maintain contact with employment. But when we look at this model right now, what this model is basically saying is that in the contextual domain, personal environmental factors interact with limitations, which in turn then impact how people interact in the career domain and will impact each facet of the career, each factor of the domain. And that the interaction of the contextual domain and the career domain will impact how people participate. So that is kind of the basic premise of this model. And the premise of the model with a lot of bi-directional arrows would indicate is that a change in one environment or a success in one environment or maybe a, a negative outcome in one environment will have a ripple effect throughout the model and the model will be dynamic and will change and is constantly changing as people grow, environments change, limitations change, and the demands of work change. Um, last thing I'll point out here before we move on is there's a little hash box between the contextual and the career domain called interventions. And that is where the bulk, not every, but a bulk of the career interventions are targeted. And that is uh, using the term use a lot in work adjustment is helping develop the congruence between the contextual and the career domain is we, we utilize interventions whether their career uh, counseling interventions or assistive technology or an assessment um, type activity or job seeking training. It's helping us uh, build a congruence between the contextual and the career domain uh, and also ultimately improve the outcomes. And you see that hash line going over to participation indicating that interventions will ultimately impact participation as well, both directly and indirectly. Okay. My last little piece here before we move on to talk about uh, with the time left of what I think are some critical issues is this model uh, lends itself and this is explained in the first chapter of the career book quite, quite uh, in, in length is, is allowing for what I call multi-level analysis. And I think one thing that I've really come to appreciate in my work with uh, as in doing career guidance as well as working with people who are providing career vocational guidance is the need to be thinking about all the different factors that are impacting the individual at that time and how they could impact career and vocational behaviors, uh, activities, outcomes, motivation. And I think we tend to, I tend to think of things in terms of the primary analysis. So for example, how does a person's functional limitations, let's say their limited ability to uh, uh, be mobile, impact their, let's say, acquisition, their ability to conduct a job search. That would be a primary, what I would call a primary across domain impact. And let's say that that person was struggling with their job search, that could have a secondary impact within domain impact on their awareness. They might, as a result of stumbling a little bit during the job search process, might have some decrease in vocational identity, like maybe I'm not that good, or maybe this isn't where I should be. And then as a result of that, as well, we might have what we would call a tertiary cross domain impact as well. That lack of individual awareness of vocational identity could decrease their personal perception in other areas, whether it's their interests, their, their perception of their identity in other areas as well as the career. So the point being is that this uh, allows for what we'd call primary, secondary, and tertiary analysis as well as what I would call within and across domain analysis. Again, I steer you to the book on this, um, other papers that we have written as well, my group has written, I've written, where this is talked a lot more in detail. Um, so just with the remaining time that I have, what are the important issues that are impacting career employment counseling in this COVID and post COVID world? And what I'm gonna to try to do here in the next three slides is give you some issues that I think are important to be taking into account as career counselors working with people with chronic health conditions and disabilities that I think are going to be factors that will uh, significantly impact outcomes in the career vocational world. 
And the first one uh, we're seeing the model again here is I think we really need to focus in on how functioning physical, psychological, affective, cognitive, communicative functioning is going to impact the career development process. And I think that the Illinois model lends to this and allows counselors, practitioners, researchers to conceptualize this multi-factor, multi-domain uh, issues that are impacting the career development process and allows us to develop a very comprehensive view of this um, so that we can take into full account, hopefully, um, the issues that are impacting people um, moving forward and help maximize their success. So the focus on functioning is critical. We've done uh, some research uh, my group has looking at functioning and the differential effect of functioning. For example, we've looked at how psychological functioning tends to impact really career awareness more and physical functioning tends to impact job maintenance more. Um, those aren't clear cut relationships all or nothing, but we start to see more impact there. And so I'd have what we start to see is a differential effect on areas of functioning on the, on the uh, career domain. That is a critical area that I think needs to be <clears throat> taken into account especially with COVID and how we might be seeing uh, factors impacted related to COVID and COVID exposure and how those might interact with already pre-existing conditions um, and have impacts on multiple areas of functioning. The second area I think that is critically important to address is, <clears throat> is the long-term effects of job loss. For people that we are working with who have lost their job as a result of COVID, or because of their physical incapacitation, potentially they maybe have lost uh, their access to jobs or their ability to work um, in the job that they were doing. We have to be aware of how this long, what are the long-term effect of losing a job and how that impacts individuals. And there's some good research being really done looking at a term called scarring, that losing a job has a long-term effect on people on how they view themselves their overall physical well-being, their psychological well-being, um, how they're going to view themselves as an individual, how they view themselves in terms of their family, and we really need to take a, take a look at this concept of scarring and how it impacts people. This is also brought up in chapter chapter one of the book as well. Vicarious unemployment. Vicarious unemployment is suggesting that people within the broader family of an individual who loses their job is also impacted. Um, that could be uh, kids who are maybe not going to do as well in school. Research would suggest who have parents lose jobs tend not to perform as well in school. Uh, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of uh, potential uh, um, negative effects within the family where people will vicariously experience the unemployment, whether that's stress themselves. It could be uh, increase in potential for violence within the family or abuse within the family, or just a parent who might become very disengaged from the family because they've lost their job. That can take many different forms and many different effects. Um, so something to think about there. And that again is outlined in chapter one. All three of these are outlined in chapter one. Uh, the other thing here is secondary health effects is that people who lose jobs tend to have decreased physical and uh, mental health as a result of that job loss. And those need to be certainly factored in when we start talking about people working with them to re-enter the labor market. The last area that I think is really critical that's um, related to uh, COVID is trauma and the impact of trauma and the need to provide trauma-informed career counseling. So I think trauma is gonna come at individuals in many different forms. We're going to see people who certainly as a result of the work that they do might be at higher risk of being exposed to traumatic events, whether that's frontline health workers dealing with people who are passing away uh, as a result of their job that they do. They see a high uh, uh, death count. We're certainly seeing a lot of frontline nurses and doctors expressing their stress related to that. So they're at increased risk for trauma. Uh, Toxic stress coming from work and also then coming into the home as a result of stress that exists at work and beyond work, financial stress, stress of kids not being in school, not being able to go to work, the uncertainty as we see these food lines, the 
very last week, very, very powerful to see the food lines and how big they are and how many people are in need and the stress and the persistent chronic toxic stress that people are under is going to impact their career counseling. And unfortunately, the last one here is that with all these, these, uh, these issues, the employment induced stress, the toxic stress, unfortunately, there could be an increase here too of childhood trauma of children experiencing trauma uh, at home whether that's abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, um, and they're not consistently engaging with the school environment that many times is kind of being the environment that can kind of flag some of those abuse issues. So again, I think a broad view of trauma and stress and how it impacts uh, individuals across multiple levels needs to be taken into account. Now, with that being said, what can we do? And beyond this conversation or our talk today to go into a lot of details about specific interventions, but there are many in interventions that are available and talked about. Um, certainly a theme that's talked about in the book, multiple chapters is the working alliance and having a good counseling relationship with the individuals that we work with. And I think the research has well sub uh, substantiated very clearly that the working alliance is a very, very important Part of the counseling con, uh, um, counseling process and very relevant to career counseling as well. So we want to make sure that we're really uh, practicing good counseling skills and really focusing on the working alliance, developing strong bonds with the clients that we're working with, realistic vocational goals, and then the tasks that are needed to achieve those. As I mentioned uh, several minutes ago, I think there's really going to be a real need for work adjustment counseling um, really helping people develop skills, uh, refine skills, learn how to apply skills that they may already have to other areas of the labor market so that they can adjust and maintain connection with the labor market. Um, a lot of times individuals might not be aware that they have some skills that are transferable to other areas um, or soft skills that they might have developed in one area that can be applied to another area or the need to develop new soft skills or things like that that could be relevant to help them maintain connection to the labor market. A lot of research we're doing right now too is we're seeing work adjustment uh, being a very psychological based process of dealing with stress, uh, interpersonal cues, communication, affective uh, capacity. So work adjustment is gonna be critical. Uh, Trauma-informed counseling is gonna be a very important part, part of this as well where we get counselors who in a career context are informed about trauma, can identify people who are struggling with trauma so that they can make appropriate referrals to providers who can help them deal with trauma, but also for them to understand the impact that trauma is going to have on the career development process. So I think that's going to be a really, really critical part of this, uh, this process um, moving forward in COVID. And then I think things that are outlined in the book that are gonna be very critical points of intervention that are gonna be relevant for um, career counselors is work analysis or job analysis is looking at work, how it's changing, what are the demands changing? Uh, that relates to transferable skills. How do people's skills that they may be developed in one area of the labor market relate to other areas of the labor market and transfer those skills to other areas that they um, believe are important or create opportunities. And then also I think a new area, especially for people with maybe more significant disabilities or significant chronic health conditions is the issue is employment uh, and being able to work with employers from a demand side perspective to help them identify jobs that can maybe be uh, restructured a little bit to bring more people into the labor market, but also help the employers move more efficiently and move more effectively and get their increased outcomes in terms of uh, work and work productivity. So um, my summary here would be that COVID-19 is going to have a significant impact on how and where work is going and how it's going to be completed. Frontline and marginalized, work, marginalized workers uh, have been and will continue to be disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The Illinois Work and Wellbeing Model provides a framework to guide career and employment services. And then the career and employment counseling uh, needs, um, as we del deliver career and employment counseling, we need to take into account the physical, psychological, cognitive, and emotional factors that are impacting the career development process. Um, I believe that's, that's it, and we'll have questions, but. 
Well, first, um, thank you, David. I, I want to just uh, chime in here. This is Rhonda Dearborn again. I'm the editor for counseling here at Springer Publishing Company, and I want to thank David for his presentation. David, do you want to say a few words maybe about also our, our, our journal um, that you are the editor of here from the National Council on Rehabilitation Education? Sure. Um, I'm the editor of the journal Rehabilitation Research Policy and Education, and it is a broad rehabilitation counseling based journal that focuses on all areas of rehabilitation counseling. Uh, and we like to also try to think that we focus on research and policy implications as it relates to delivering rehabilitation counseling and vocational rehabilitation counseling services. So yes, yeah, so we want to remind you that we uh, publish these two journals that might be of interest to you before we proceed here and just uh, just some information about the journals. Uh, David, you can go move to the to the next slide. So we want to remind you that the book should be available imminently. Uh, the new edition will be publishing in, in the next few days. Um, so if you want to get a, uh, a an electronic copy for uh, review, um, if you're interested in purchasing bulk sales or individual sales, um, there is a code available, as you see on the bottom of the screen, uh, for 25% plus free shipping in the United States uh, for a copy of the new edition of the book. And we're going to be taking some questions and answers right now. Uh, we do have a question right now from Julie Hill, David. Um, how do you see this model working for long haul COVID patients? And how do we best apply this when working with this population? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think where this model is really relevant is it is going to take, it's going to focus on the interaction of, in the contextual do domain, personal, environmental, and functioning factors. And over the long haul, as people develop, uh, chronic health conditions or have pre-existing health conditions that are impacted, we might see how that person's functioning changes over time. And as a result of that change over time, we're going to need to be aware of then how that impacts uh, their ability to engage in the career activities. It might be that a person uh, has a, comes to the point physically or psychologically where they can't continue to work anymore in their job that they're doing and need to make a job change. So that's going to be uh, something that will be um, impacted and um, will need to be addressed. It could be also be that people are displaced right now. And over the long haul, we're going to have to look at how they might develop skills um, and um, re-enter the labor market and how their functioning impacts that and how their personal and environmental factors interact to support the functioning or increase their functioning or um, you know, strengthen their ability to meet the demands of the labor market. So this model, I think, is dynamic in nature and will allow for people to constantly reevaluate um, individuals as they change over time. Okay, uh, we have another question, and I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Jane. Jane Ria Vernier, are you aware of any fair employment testing to ensure that there is fair hiring of people with disabilities in the labor force? Um, that's a really good question, and I'm not sure that I do know about any specific testing that would address fairness of hiring, if that's what the question is regarding. Um, and I think fairness of hiring is a critical issue. Some of the research I've done with a colleague of mine, Phil Rumrell, uh, Brian McMahon, on looking at EEOC claims as it relates to discrimination in the labor market, we see that there is different types of discrimination based on age. So uh, younger individuals tend to experience different types of discrimination compared to older individuals in the labor market. Um, older individuals tend to experience more discrimination related to retention, and this makes perfect sense. Retaining jobs, getting reasonable accommodations and different things like this, where younger individuals tend to report more claims as it relates to discrimination of entering the labor market, um, unfair hiring or interviewing bias or different things like that. Um, but I do not know any of any specific testing, if that's a question regarding fairness in the labor market, fairness in hiring. Okay, uh, we've got one last question. 
Uh, given the Illinois model's focus on functioning, what have you found regarding how functioning impacts different aspects of the career development process? What are the potential implications for services? Yeah, um, we've, we're in the midst of, uh, we've conducted quite a bit of research at the University of Illinois using this model, um, and we're starting to see it and starting to be disseminated where we're starting to see what I would call a differential effect. And I kind of alluded this, to this in our presentation, the presentation is we're starting to see how people, their psychological functioning really impacts the awareness part, their identity and how they think about their career and how they think about themselves relating to the labor market. So people who are in, incurring some psychological injuries or uh, have psychological conditions stemming from um, COVID or had pre-existing psychological conditions that are exacerbated by COVID is we have found that there may be more impact on their identity, their awareness, how they think about themselves in a career context of being able to interact with the labor market. Conversely, when we start to see the physical effects and physical functioning, we start to see that their that is more directly related to their ability to maintain employment, how people maintain their jobs, keep the jobs, <clears throat> stay congruent with the jobs once they're on the job. And lastly, we're finding that this job search piece, this job acquisition piece, tends to be probably the most complex piece because it tends to be an interplay between both psychological and physical functioning. And I think that makes some sense of it's a very stressful period. So how people are functioning from a psychological perspective is really relevant, but also the physical demands needed to meet that are going to be very critical as well. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for your time and attention. We realize that this is an extremely busy time of year, um, made that much more crazy because of all the extenuating circumstances. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, David, and thank you for the internal team here at Springer. And once again, um, this will be disseminated. This recording of this event will be sent out to you uh, in five to seven business days along with the PowerPoint deck um, in a PDF that you will receive. And uh, we again, thank you so much for your time. Be safe and well.